edition of Impact with Jay Cameron. I'm coming to you from Accra, Ghana, where we're bridging the gap between Africa and the African diaspora. And one of the things that we're doing with our sit-down interviews is having conversations that uh, a lot of times are uncomfortable for many, but are needed. And so today, I'd like to welcome back to Maximum Impact, Miss Mavis Akos, and she is, you're from Ghana, yeah, but awesome. you live in Amsterdam, Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Yeah, so, the Netherlands. And so it's called Holland. It's Holland, Holland, yeah. Holland the Netherlands, Holland, yeah. the Dutch. The Dutch. Yes. The, the Dutch. Yes. And um, you were on last year with your daughter, Giselle. Yes. And we had a really good conversation. Folks really uh, resonated with the conversation we were having. But we didn't get a chance to really dive into the story. Yeah. And I wanted to come back. You, you happen to be back in Ghana. Uh, from the Netherlands, I'm just getting back in yeah. myself from um, from Tanzania, as they would call it. Yeah. And I wanted to make sure we had the sit down conversation because I believe that your story and the layers to your story are going to resonate because the comments were on fire yeah. on the previous video. And again, if you didn't c catch the last video, yeah. make sure you watch the previous yeah. video, Mavis and Giselle, yeah. uh, where we were hanging out over at Elikims. So I want you to walk down your story, I don't want you to hold anything back, because uh, a lot of times people will hold back and they won't bring the real, and yeah. that's part of what we, yeah. we want to make sure that we bring the real and people really understand uh, some of our stories, because we don't realize how similar we are, they are. So Mavis, tell me what was life like, I guess, growing up in Ghana, Ghana. and what led you to the Netherlands? Okay. Um uh, Ghana is a very great country. I want people to understand that Ghana is a beautiful place and if you are brought up in a normal way, you can live here and you can have a good life and a, a normal life. But my life was not like that. Um, I grew up with my mom and dad in the beginning and um, they left to Nigeria and then they came back home. And so they came to build this uh, petrol station they were in the oil business. So um, they had two tank stations, Shell and Texaco. Okay. And life was good. I went to a boarding school, everything was fine. And then later on, my, my dad got married to some new younger woman. And I think that's where everything changed. Um, he left my mom. When I came home, everything has changed. There was a divorce. And this lady came with her whole family. And I think that's also what made things messed up a bit. Um, my father trusted his brothers or something, and then they uh, ripped him off. Mm -hmm. They stole most of his money, so he became down. And then I had to go and live with my grandmother, the mother of my father. And that went well for a while, but then she got sick, and then she told me to go and live with my mom in uh, Kumasi, in a place called Wokrom. I stayed there for a few years, like a year or two, with my stepdad. My mom has re remarried. And the things that went there, that went down there was very hard for me. My mom, as my bi biological mom, was very uh, mean to me. Uh, she wasn't as loving as I thought she would be. A lot of African mothers, and I say this to advise African mothers to be very tender and kind to their children because sometimes they traumatize their children without knowing it, you know, with the things they say and how they also uh, abuse them uh, physically. Uh, my mom decided that my dad has spoiled me and that she wants to like straighten me up and she did it all wrong. She beats me every day on small things like you didn't wash the dishes or some small stuff. She just physically abused me emotionally and as abuse can go, any kind of abuse was done to me. My stepdad was also trying to sleep with me. Mm. And when I told my mom, she would do nothing about it. And that was also very, very painful to me and hurtful. Um, when I would tell my, da my mom, my stepdad will call me a liar and then that would be it. Eventually, some bar that we had, it was like a chop bar, we call it. Okay. A place where you can come eat, 
and drink. And one thing stuck with me. Uh, a lot of men came there because I was very beautiful, but also young. But I look older, but I was young. Okay. Okay. And my breasts developed very faster. So when the man would come there, they would start touching me on, on pleasant places like my ass or my boobs. So they were physically, the men would come and touch you? Yes. Okay. And then when I would tell my, I would tell them I don't like that, please don't touch me. My mom would be very mad and scream at me like, shut up, don't drive my customers away, shut up. And she would really yell at me and be so mad at me that I'm saying to the men, don't touch me. Mm -hmm. So I felt like she was ready to sell me out to anybody who will buy me. Mm -hmm. And that's not how I understood life from my father. My father was very tender, very gentle with me. He somehow understood me in all kinds of forms. I used to ask a lot of questions. I was a very curious child. And I always asked, why is this that? Why is that? And my, my, my dad was willing to tell me everything. And he told me to be very careful with men. Mm -hmm. And he told me everything that I needed to know about men. My, my mom was the opposite. She was just telling me to shut up and I asked too many questions. And for some reason, I didn't know if she was my real biological mom because she wasn't so loving. And I think maybe because she was abused by my dad a bit, she was um, not happy with herself. That's mm. how I see it now. So you do, do you know she was your biological mother or you wonder? She is my she biological mother. She is your biological mother. She is my biological mother. But the my way mom that she behaved girls. towards you didn't yeah. seem like the way no. a biological mother. There was no love. Okay. There was no um, kindness. There was no, she said the most horrible things that any mother could say to a child. That I was never add up to anything and I was zero and I was nothing. And she lowered my self-esteem to zero because of the way she spoke to me. And a lot of African mothers speak to their children like this here. And I really advise them to be more kind to their children and more friendly to their children and be more understanding. Up till now, I am a mother of four children and I want to be anything but my mother. I am so loving to my children. I kiss them good morning mm. to wake them up. I'm so sweet to them because I don't want to be anything like my mother. How do you think that that led to you leaving Ghana or was there something in between that because obviously, you know, and we're speaking about Ghana specifically, mm -hmm. so when, we, when you hear Africanism, we refer to every African country, it could be, we're talking about your particular story here in yeah. Ghana. Yeah. With that, as a young woman, how do you think that affected you as far as your behaviors, your mindset, as you were developing? Um, I was never a child who thinks about abroad or Europe or anything. I just had to come to Accra to even have contact with white people. But where I was living, there was not that many white people there. But I just decided to um, be curious about this other world because of how I saw people as a waitress. I was working later in Accra as a waitress, and I saw how uh, tourist people come in. They smell always very good. And I don't know, there was something about the smell that I liked. I thought, I like to smell good like that. Wherever they came from, I like to smell like that. But I wasn't like focused on it, like I have to leave Ghana. I was just curious about where they came from and these, what were the, is the, there. these were the white people who would yes, go. Okay. Yes, yes. And I met one British woman in particular, and she told me that there was nothing there and that the, it rains 24 7. It's just not special in any way. So they save up money to come on holidays here. To Africa, to yeah, Ghana. Yeah, to Ghana. And so to other parts of Africa. She told me the honest truth, and that is exactly what it is. It is not that special. It's just they work, 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 she tell me. And they save up money to come on holiday. But like... I have seen them here. <laughs> I have seen them here doing that. Uh. Things didn't go as well with my mom and my stepdad and me. So I moved to go and live with my sister. In Ghana? Yes, in okay, Ghana. Okay, so we're still in Ghana. Yes. And I thought my sister would be much kinder. That I have two sisters, Evelyn and Gifty and me. My mom had three girls. So I went to Gifty, the middle one. 
and she basically treated me like a maid and a child, you know, a maid She's and older a than master, you. yeah. Okay. She's five years older than oh, me. Okay, yes. And she made my life also quite hard. It went like from frying pan to fire. So we were in a tech road. That's How old were you? I was about 14. So during these critical developmental years, this is where you're dealing with a yeah, lot of this. Yeah. So you're going through the puberty changes, physical yes, changes. Yes. Now you're moving around. Yes. You're still longing for the love of your father. He's yeah. gone, but you're definitely longing for the love I of your mother. Really and that's him. absent. And, and from what you're telling us, has turned into a form of abuse. Abuse, yeah. Definitely abuse. So, so here you are, a 15, 16 year old. Yeah. Living with all of these challenges. Yeah. What decisions did you make at that point in your life? Because now your mindset is developing. Yeah. Now you're thinking. Now you're... I, I think I could have gone so wrong off the path, but I was always focused. I was a very bright child in school, and I was focused on school. My teacher came home to tell my mom, you have to focus on her school because she's very smart. My mom said she doesn't have money to pay my school fees. Mm -hmm. I was... Um, in a very good school, international school, she moved me from there to a very cheap school and still didn't pay the cheap school. So my teacher was paying for my school fees. Mm. And she told me, the school that you're going every day, who is going to pay your school fees? That's what my mom asked me. But there was enough money to pay my school fees. And I'm going to go there today. Like today, um, what really made me so fragile because I am now um, 23, 24 years away, and I've never been with a black man. And I've never been with a black man because I was raped too many times here. So now my image of a black man is very changed. Okay, so now so that, I can speak with them and everything, but it's very hard for me to connect with them on a sexual level. Because you were raped here in Ghana. Yes, too many times. By other Ghanaian men. Yes. How many times would you say you've been raped? I would say four. Four times? Yeah. Starting at what age? I was just 13, and with my mother's place, the guy who raped me the first time, he was 35 years old. I was just 13. 35 and 13, okay. Yeah. I think that is, it is not okay. And I told my mother about it. That's what hurts me. She told me it is her customer, so she cannot arrest him. And it's like they just sweep it under the carpet. Were, they, were all of the men who raped you your mother's customers? No. Um, that particular one. And then when I went to live with my sister, one of the men also who came around my sister also. Normally when you have a sister, they send you to their boyfriend's house to go and bring this, go and bring that. And that's normal in Ghana. But we have to be careful how we send our young ones, especially the teenagers who are growing up with the new breast, everything. Mm. We have to be careful how we send them away to our boyfriend's house or our husband's house, go and bring this, go and bring that. I don't do that to my children because I know the consequences of it now. Right. So I went there one time and he just locked the door. I did everything to stop him, it didn't work. So that was the second time? The second time. And then there were two and subsequent the, times after yeah, that. Yeah, in Accra. So with, with once that happened, I'm assuming at this point in time you're moving into adulthood. Yes. Your perception of African men, black men. Is damaged. Is damaged completely. at that point. So I th think they see something beautiful and not all, all of them, but excuse me, not all of them. They see something beautiful and they feel this empowerment that they have to have it. Mm. And it is a little bit forced. And I think even if a woman spread her legs and she says, I don't want you to sleep with me, you have to respect that. So the respect of the no is very right. important to me. And I feel like they don't hear when you say no. Do you think that's a, 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 a African thing, a black thing, or just perhaps a man thing? Um, I can't tell, but I think any man, whether you're blue, green, yellow, it doesn't matter which color of man you are. If a woman is interacting with you, mm -hmm. and at some point they change their mind and say no, you have to respect it and just appreciate the no, right. and then wait till their own time. 
But I think it's also a culture thing okay. that men feel so empowered than women. So sometimes they feel like I don't know. I, it's maybe very more dominant. I guess perhaps, perhaps the it was the dominance. Is the maybe, the, maybe the age difference. Yeah, the, the domination. Position. I think the dominant way of thinking that I'm the man and you are the woman okay. kind of thing. And I was all about against all the traditional um, ways when I was growing up. I didn't want to cook for my husband because my mom always said, Oh, come and learn how to cook so you can cook for your husband. And for that particular saying, I didn't want to cook. I didn't want to learn to cook. Up till now, I now can cook jollof rice or maybe some soup, but I can't really cook a traditional food traditional because I Ghanaian never learned. Food. I never learned. I didn't want to learn to cook for my husband. I think my husband should cook for himself if you want to eat. We are both couple, and if you're hungry, you can eat. You can cook for me too. So not that I don't want to cook for you, but we can cook for each other. And so that's, some, and that's something that you, I guess, I a was, philosophy you I developed. I was rebelling against I the understand. culture. I was always, re I don't know why. I was just five years old and I would rebel the whole time. Like, I don't want to do all these things that traditional people do, that they just get married and all they do is serve the man. And the women don't get anything. Well, let's talk about this a little bit, and, and then we'll get to the Netherlands and how you got there, because I know in some of our previous conversations, you talked about how even this discussion might cause you some backlash yeah. from within your family, because I guess they don't want you to talk about it. No. They find it. And, and I'm finding that in many cultures, when people begin to talk about some of the dysfunctions, the past yeah. abuses, the traumas that it have occurred. It becomes a problem, yeah. Why do you think it becomes a problem when people start talking about the truth because of what they've experienced? Because we have seen in our culture called unsaid things. Like, things, some, peop some things are just unspoken about. Just, they don't have a healthy way. I think most Africans don't have a very healthy way of dealing with trauma or dealing with problems like this. So then they just blush it off or sweep it under the carpet. And a lot of, I think that a lot of men are very damaged here and a lot of women are damaged, like in a traumatizing way that they cannot really uh, comprehend like how much damage they are. I see it from my sisters that they, they never really dealt with the past. So it always comes back and haunts you. And in Europe, I've learned that you can put everything on the table and talk about it, resolve things, digest things. If something happens, like, when the rape happened and my mom would have talked to me about it and then talked to the man and maybe dealt with it, I wouldn't have a problem now. Now, I, since I, I became a mother, I'm afraid to leave my children to even a babysitter to go mm. to work okay. because I'm afraid that they will touch them. Okay. So it has affected me in a very strange way that I, am ne I was always a stay-at-home mom. I didn't want to move an inch from my children. You know, I want them to be so protected that nobody will ever lay their hands on my children. And if anybody should do that, I think I'm capable of killing right now because I cannot stand any mother who would not protect their child hmm. from such an abuser or a molester or, or sex abuse person, you know? Um, it's just very sad. It is very sad. You made a very interesting point about the traumatization that people go through. Yeah. Have. I guess in the process of this, have you ever sought therapy or anything? Or because I know that you know in certain cultures that's not. Here they think crazy people go to therapy. You, why should you go to therapy? You must be out of your mind to go to therapy. But in Europe, they taught me that it is okay to talk to somebody about your 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 problems. Now this is white Europe. Yeah. Okay, white when because we, we reference Europe, it could be because you have Black Europe and you have white Europe. And okay. like in America, well, in Holland, in Holland, which is probably I like like ninety nine percent white. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But but like in America, they have a stigma. It's just becoming popular for Black Americans to get therapy. Okay. But for years, they're like, no, there's no need for therapy. Or they would go to church and they would say, okay, yeah. pray it off, and yeah. you know, you got no, the demon in you. No, but it doesn't go away with praying. You really need to talk to a professional to. Well, some people yeah. might argue. Some people might argue that and say, well, you know, the pray they prayed and it went away. I mean, I, I mean, guess it depends on each person. Everybody digests trauma very differently, so you have to find out what makes what works for you. Mm -hmm. I am a professional photographer. I took 
uh, an intense um, therapy in my photography. So when I made pictures, I find out that it made me feel good, especially if I have taken a very good picture. So I just started, I bought a camera and I'm just taking pictures and I take a lot of beautiful pictures and that also helps me. I read a lot. I'm African who doesn't like so much noise. I like reading, I like writing. Unfortunately, most African men can date me because I write a lot and they don't like reading, so they tell me I write too much. But it's them who don't like reading. So what they are too lazy to read. I don't know, but they tell me I write too much. But if I have something to say, I just say it in typing or voicemail. So what about by you going to Europe? Because I think that's probably one of the things that uh, people might be wondering is how you ended up in Ghana, you were born, all of this that you went through in Ghana. Yeah, in Kumasi. So I decided, there's one incident that stuck with me. When I was living with my sister, the rape was one thing. And I couldn't talk to her. I couldn't connect with her in any level. She was so into herself. She couldn't even see me. I was invisible. So one time I came home and she threw my things out. And I asked her, why can't I live with her? It was my auntie's house. She told me she can't take care of me anymore. I should just go. And she didn't care where I was going. I should just go. And really, seriously, she called the police and had them put handcuffs on my hands and drug me like a, a thief mm. in the middle of the street. And that made my soul so sad. Like, I felt like I can't depend on my family because they are really not there for me. So I used my last money to take the STC bus to go to Accra. And I remember the time the bus arrived, it was around six o'clock, it was very late. And then when I got out of the bus, I didn't know where to go. It was, I have rich family also here. Fortunately or unfortunately, I have rich family, but every time you go to the rich family, they always make you sit there like for three hours and tell you your, your uncle just left the building so you can't see him. And they know you definitely need help, but they don't help you. They just don't help you because of whatever reason, the rich always look down on the poor people and they don't help each other out. So then I decided to find my own way. And I saw a lady that I uh, didn't know. I asked her, can I stay by you? And she said, yes. So that's how it started. The next day I had to move on to the next way to find my way and I went to Labadi Beach. I remember I went to Labadi Beach, not the hotel, but the Labadi Beach itself. And I was just looking at the sea thinking like, hmm, if God says he can create all this big sea, how, why can't he help me? Like I was just starting to think deeply about a lot of things in my own conscience. And then I turned on my right sorry, on my left, mm -hmm. and I saw two Germans, uh, Helmut and Hans. They were just standing there, and I decided to become a waitress. I didn't know what waitressing is, but I saw girls serving on a bar, and I went there and I told them I want to become a waitress. I'm a waitress. They asked me, have you done it before? I said, yes, but I haven't, obviously. Well, that's a viable and technique kicked yes. in. You got to do what you got to do. And they say you can start now. So that's how it started. And then when I started, I was cracking the, the beer, you know, it mm. was everything was Dropping falling everything. down. And then they said, okay, uh, you, they call some girl, Frida, help her. Mm. And then I had to learn instantly how to hold a tray. And then I work with them. At the end of the evening, I asked them, can I sleep here? And Helmut, the old one, said, You'll be eating by mosquito to death. You can't sleep here, but you can go with my younger brother and his wife home. And the younger brother was married to a Ghanaian woman with two kids. And I went home with them. The house was beautiful, <laughs> but they smoked a lot of marijuana. Okay. So I stayed there for about two weeks. So you got a little buzz in the meantime. <laughs> you got a little Mary Jane in your system, all right. <laughs> they were just very, very different, with different lifestyle that yeah. I am intended to. So um, I think just two weeks they told me that the owner of the house is coming, so I have to move out. And I didn't have anybody to depend on but the waitress who was her working with me. I asked her, Could, can I stay with you? She said, tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. And she just zigzagged with me. So I begged her. And then she brought me home to Teshinungwa. That's where she stayed. And then I find out she was living in a very tiny room with eight people. Mm. So that was perhaps why. 
So I joined in. I just found a little spot and yeah, in. put my stuff right at the door. Okay. And at night, the he she had a son, cousins, everything. They would be touching my breast, and I'll tell Frida, uh, "This is what your son is doing." So oh, he's just a child, but the child was like eight years or something, and I ignore it. I just try to work and come home work and she had a particular boyfriend who came all the time to the house and he was always staring at me and one time we were sleeping and then he also raped me so, the same, so uh, this happened again yeah the- again but this time i did got pregnant mm. and i decided i'm not gonna um have this baby because i did i couldn't take care of myself so i went back to kumase got an abortion I went to my best friend, her name is Barbara, I told her I cannot, um, this is what has happened, and I cannot have the baby. At the time, she was pregnant too, and then she said we should have it. She's totally against abortion, but I told her no way. I don't know why I'm not staying in Ghana. I feel like I'm going to leave Ghana, so I'm not going to have a child here. And then we went to do it. Even when we were sitting at the abortion center, she said, you can change your mind now. I said, no, I'm not doing it. And I got rid of it. I almost died from it, so I don't condone. Uh, I don't condone abortion. It's not good. So later on, um, I started working uh, papaya restaurants. Okay. And later to Golden Tulip, there was some calling about some. You can like go to school or do something, mm-hmm. and then you can uh, like do some course, and then you can become a professional waitress. So I joined in. And then I became a professional waitress. So soon we were serving the government and all these uh, MPs and yeah. So ministers. how did this lead to you then going to? So when my college? mom heard that I'm working in Golden Tulip, then she came to me and said that, oh, she has some family members that she want me to see them. But before all the struggle, she didn't come. But when she heard I'm working in Golden Tulip, that is an improvement in Ghana for a lifestyle. So mm. then, then the family come in again. You know, when you are struggling, you don't find your families. But when you get a place to put your feet, then they appear, they appear, they come out. What do they want when they appear? When they think you have something, then they want to show themselves. Hmm. All your unexpected aunties, uncles, they all come out. When they think you have money or you have a good place to stay. You know, but before then, not. That's how I felt. Anyway, she brought me to some family member. I don't know what they went to say or to talk about there, but I wasn't inside the room. And then when we left, we just ate and drink. And when we left, that's when they called me and asked me if I want to go to Europe. And it was a tricky question because I was thinking, hmm, who wouldn't want to go to Europe? So what kind of question is this? So I said, yes, of course. They said, okay, bring her two passport pictures. And then that's it, wait. And I brought the two passport pictures. I somehow thought they wouldn't be able to pull it off because a lot of people want to go abroad. Right. And it doesn't happen, so how will they, how are they going to do it? So it was like my way of challenging them, like, you can't. And then when I brought it, two weeks later, they called me and said, are you ready to go to Europe? Like, do you mm. want to go to Europe? Still want to go? I said, yes. But they did not tell me we are going by land. Oh. <laughs> so <you're> so <laughs> now, me working in the airport road, Golden Tulip, I always know where the airport is. I've been standing there, always wondering, like, hmm, when is my time going to come? So I know where the Kutuka airport is. But this time we took STC to go to Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire. Right. And I was sitting in a bus thinking, hmm, I don't know about this abroche, but yeah, let's see. I was always very adventurous. I like, I was a curious child. I like to just know everything and nothing. Just go in every place that people don't go. So it was just a challenge for me. And then when we got to Abidjan, we got lost, but finally they found us. And then we continued from Abidjan to Bamako, Cote d'Ivoire. And so you're uh, going by road. Up. Yeah. But you, did you know where you were going? Did you know you were no, going to? No, the guy just, uh, they, they call him connection man. He just tell. Um, he just said, be quiet what and ride. What you should do, uh-huh. like go here, do this, go there, don't go there, do this. And then I have a small note, notebook, so I write everything down. And he couple everything, everybody except me. 
We were about 13 people. Okay. And we are not allowed to talk to each other. So we just... So this sounds pretty gangster at this point. You can't talk yeah, to each other. Yeah, because gotta... if you talk to each other and they arrest you, they will arrest everybody. So they were very strict about acting like we why don't would, know each why other. Why would they arrest somebody? Because if they arrest you and we are all together, they will arrest all of us. So you have to be very uh, conservative, like you don't know each other, but you know each other. Okay. So when they arrest you, you're on your own. Mm. Then not, not everybody go down but, with you. But why would they arrest you? I think that's the... Yeah, we are going illegally. Okay. All right. Illegally. It's yes. not legal. So this is it's not illegal. illegal. This is yeah. under the table. Yeah, under this the, is the table. We are going to Europe with not our passports. Oh, you didn't my have a passport? Pass, my passport was with a man's name. Oh. Apresi. Okay. It was with a man's name. So you making so, it happen. Okay. This yeah. is getting fascinating. So you, yeah. So you by boat, so by road. So, okay, so you go up through Morocco and all of that. Yeah. And when then you get to, to Spain. Morocco and in Morocco, something happened. There's a place called Tanger. And that's where we were supposed to take the boats. But everybody got on a boat except me. I couldn't cross the boat. The, the people there, the, the security men, they didn't like me. They keep sending me away. And I didn't know why. So we try morning, evening, afternoon, night. Every new security man wouldn't let me go on a boat. So then I told the guy, I don't think I want to go to Europe anymore. I want to go back to Ghana. And then he said, you've come all the way here, and so you can't just go to Ghana. And he brought me to some mountain, and he showed me, this is Europe, and you could see Europe from where we were standing, really. He said, this is Europe, and this is Africa. And the only thing that's here between us is the sea. And you can't just go home. That's when I knew a bit, like, I'm not on my own. Like, my, I'm, I'm not, it's not a free will. It's like by force. Mm. Because I thought they made me believe like it's my own idea that I want to go. Okay. But then when I wanted to go home, I couldn't. Hmm. So that's when I started thinking, hmm, there's something fishy about this. But I still was very naive. I was just 19 years old. I was very naive. I didn't know a lot about the world. So I just trusted them because they were sort of family members. Okay. You know? So then when we got to Europe, How'd you get to Europe? I mean, when you got to Europe, we, how'd you he, get there? You saw the gave, mountain and you no, walked the sea. No, ga he gave me to a taxi driver and spoke some Arab to him. And the taxi driver had to bring me to Algeria border, I think. Oh, you went to Algeria. Yes. So there he said, when I cross the sea, I don't have to, uh, they will not check me anymore by the boat. Mm. So when I, cro when I cross the, sorry, the, the border, okay. there's a border. And when you cross the border, then you don't have to be checked anymore. You can just go in, inside the ship. Oh, okay. So I did that. And when I got to Algeciras, my ship came to Algeciras. So then I had to go in a specific uh, hotel, also stay there, and at 4 o'clock in the morning, I had to take a bus called Dia Bus. No other buses, but Dia Bus. Okay. And then I have to go to Madrid. And so the bus takes Spain. three days okay. on the road. So when I got to Madrid, I had to be picked up by some family, but the family didn't come, so I had to go on the address. That's how I knew that in Europe, people work with addresses. So then when I was there, I saw that there were Ghanaian people do dealing with cocaine and other things, like illegal things going on. But I There's a whole like illegal kind of setup there. Yeah, Everybody just had their own little system. I keep quiet and I, I'm just passing through, you know? And then after that, he came to take us to France. I stayed with an auntie there. I say this as if you think that your family member is in Europe and if you are there, everything is going to be fine. You are just joking. The people, like you call them family, they can be very mean, like snakes, like, like ever. Like I was shocked. The, the lady sat me down and said, this is Europe. You have to pay water bill, lights bill, everything. I don't know how many bills she said. I have to pay, and I just came. I don't have anything. She forced me to pay, mm -hmm. and if you don't pay, you own them. So they try to make you feel like you own them, you own them, you own them. So at the end of the day, you own them so much that you have to like somehow pay them back. And the lady was not nice. Even if she would make a chicken soup and I eat some, I have to go and buy a whole chicken and then remake the soup again. 
That's how she treated me. And she's the youngest of my mother's sisters. So this is your biological auntie from your mother, yes. who you've and already I, had issues with. So that could be, you have issues with your mom. No, I don't have issue with this one. I don't, I haven't heard from her before. Okay. But when I met her, I thought she would be kinder, but she wasn't. So you're in France, you do that. How do you migrate or up to? So after two weeks staying there, we went to Belgium. And in Belgium, we stayed there for a while. And then they brought me to Holland and told me that they have a work for me. They have found a work. Now, when you are here, you hear that uh, it's very hard to find work when you're in abroad and because of paper raising all this and that. So then um, they were very happy and joyful that they have a job for me. And I was looking at them in a very suspicious way like, okay, uh, I've heard different than what you guys are saying, but I will go anyway. So they brought me to Holland and then we, it was a long ride and then when we Rich Holland, we drove through a very strange street. I've never seen this street in my life. It was with glasses and it's like a red light, you know, next to the people. And the people are standing in the glasses with underwears, like panties and bras. And oh, that I, was a store? Was that a store? Or no, these are real people no. standing there with underwear and yes, panties on? Yes, they call it red lights. Oh, I think I heard about that. Districts. Okay, I think I heard about that. And then they drove me through there, and then they stopped the car. And I was thinking, what is this place, you know? And then the room that they went with me inside, there was a lady called Grace. She saved my life. Mm. She is like my mother uh, age, you know? Okay. I don't know her, I never met her before. So in front of that lady, it's when they're gonna set up the rules for me. They tell me that bringing me from Ghana to Europe is gonna cost me $10,000. And there is no way that I can find that money for them unless I sell myself. So basically now you become a sex slave. Yeah, they want to do that with me. I said to them, no way, I cannot, this is not my work. I'm a waitress. They said, no, I cannot waitress to pay them 10,000. So by force, I have to do it. So when I said no, she got upset, she went outside to make a phone call. And then that's when the lady got a chance to talk to me. She tell me, they are trying to sex trade you and you have the right to free yourself. And Holland is the best way and the best place to free yourself. So when she come back from making her phone call, tell her you are not going to another location with her and you want to not go anywhere with her. She said this thing to me in like two seconds, I think. And she said, be bold and say these things. And if she touch you or abuse you in any form and police come, she will be arrested, not you. And when you see the police, run to the police, not away from the police. But the whole time they made me believe that when I see the police, I should run away from the police. But Ooh. I should rather run to the police. But you know, that's interesting because I was so, told that same story. Uh, you know the situation on Lake Volta in Ghana mm -hmm. with the... Uh, the children who are doing the fishing yeah and one of the people who actually rescues them the stories that the children are told by the slave master mm. is that if you see those people run from them because they're coming to cut your hands off mm -hmm. so the boys when they see the people who are actually coming to help them they run, they away. run away from them yeah. and so when you that's what it reminded yeah. me of when you talked about in holland you yeah. run towards the police yeah now in america we have a whole different philosophy of running towards the police yes, you know, know because it's yeah. because of the Dangerous. abuses yeah. of some yeah. uh in that particular um institution yeah uh, you know they're taking advantage of abuse of power so i yeah. guess hu humanity has abuses of yeah. power on so many different levels so what did you do when she came back? It took me a bit of convincing though because I was always afraid of the police also because of what my sister did. That traumatized me. So I don't see police as friendly people. But the girl said, the woman said to me, the Dutch police are the nicest police on earth. Like they are so super cool and I should just go to them and they will help me. Hmm. And then she keep quiet afterwards, like she didn't say anything, she doesn't know me. So Almost like a guardian angel. Yes, really. And her name is Grace, which is also like Grace, you know? 
So when the lady come back, she was furious. She wanted to take all my papers. She tell me, give me all my your papers. I brought my own uh, Ghanaian passport, my own birth set, everything. She took everything and left me in the middle of the streets in Holland. Just like that and left. Ooh. And I was sitting there like on my small suitcase feeling very disorientated. I didn't know what to do because I don't know this place. I don't know anything. I don't know anybody. And um, there was a white man, a two meter white man, very tall guy. He now was this lady, this lady who took your things, was yeah. she white also? No, she's a, no, no, she's a black person. Interesting. Yeah, a Ghanaian person. Interesting. And I talk about this as the, there is a slavery from 400 years ago, but there is also a modern slavery now where people actually bring their family members or their people to abroad and sell them or try to sell them. So it's not only going on from before, but even now. But then our people are doing it. Well, you know, that's why I wanted people. to ask you. That's why I wanted to ask you because what I'm what I'm hearing is um, a very interesting dynamic. Yeah. Because I'm now seeing where, and this is just me listening mm -hmm. with my own ears. Maybe some other people are watching and mm -hmm. hearing it completely differently. Mm -hmm. But as you as I'm walking back through your story, mm -hmm. you, it seems as if the very people. Who look like you? Yeah. Who are supposed to care for you? Yeah. Were the very ones who were abusing and trying to sell you? Yeah. And, and and so that's and, and that's a human trait. That's it's not yeah. just a you know it's human not human trafficking. Yeah. And it's a human it's a human behavior that happens in really all cultures, but in particular uh, because we're talking about Africa and the African diaspora and mm -hmm. how you ended up in Holland. Th this side of the story is oftentimes not told. Mm -hmm. You know, it's oftentimes neglected because yeah. uh, maybe the de the devaluation of African life, of melanated life. They yeah. say, well, it's no big deal. You know, just kind of deal yeah. with it. But that's why I wanted to ask the question about the who was the person in Holland who took your passport, who did all these different things, and that was another person. That was another person from Ghana who did that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The same people who brought me. Okay. They took the stuff from because, me. So they were looking for money. It is power. It okay. is power. When you're traveling, I say this to help young youth people. Like when you don't know somebody uh, or a family member, you know them a little bit. They bring uh, a few uh, gifts from abroad. Don't just trust people because they bring a few gifts from abroad for you. You know, you can't trust just anybody to go to abroad no. or Europe or America. Here, the people will be nice to you, but when you are there, it will be another story. Here, when people hear China, they jump. When they hear Dubai, they jump. You know, when they hear Europe, they jump even higher. But if I was a Ghanaian, and I think the way that I know things now, and somebody come, a family member, and say, I'm bringing you to abroad, I would think twice before I follow them. You can't just follow people out of desperation. Even if you are eating gari here or you are selling uh, tomatoes, let's say, you are better off here selling tomatoes than following somebody untrustworthy to go to abroad. And I because think because they will do bad things to you. But I think the key they word that you said. They have agenda always. That's the, the key word that you said was following someone untrustworthy. Yeah. You know, and because some people um, obviously do very well traveling abroad. Some people do very well when they come here. Yeah. It, it's I, I, what I'm hearing in this because I and, and I want to ask you this question because I think in our previous conversations you talked about how at a certain point in time in your life you determined that you were going to you, I guess marry someone white is that you yeah. said you know I, I'm going to marry someone white yeah and could that have been because of the rapes and everything that you had endured yes yes I I, 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 I saw that um, I was very affectionate woman okay. I like to show myself I love kisses a lot I love everything a lot. I felt like our men were not so, they don't even touch each other in streets. Back then, eh? I don't mm. know about now, but back then uh, a guy would not touch you or hold you in the streets. And I kind of had an idea of what white people are, like they, they are very affectionate, they kiss in public and they're touching, they show themselves. And I kind of like that. So I thought maybe that's what I should marry. 
But unfortunately, the guy I married to wasn't like that. I see. He was as African as African. <laughs> he he, 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 was, he was a white guy, but he was as African. <laughs> no. But I'm sure you got some African guy, no. guys out here that got some affection with them now. Well, yeah. well I haven't found one yet. Yeah, but you got to spend I, more time. Got to travel the continent a little bit if more. If I yeah. find an integrated <laughs> black guy who like kissing outside and well, like might, a lot of be, kisses goes, and act like a... He might be over in Tanzania or somewhere down in Botswana. Maybe I will do it. Yeah, maybe I will have Check out the continent a little more. Yes. But um, gradually, I'm coming back from that, from from that fear of being with a black man. I'm coming out of that, you know. Okay. Now I actually feel like I am over it, and I can be with a black man, but not just any black man. Right. Well, I want well somebody really special. But you know what? I guess it may maybe you had to go through because you married. You ended up marrying a white man. Yeah. And you have four beautiful children. Four beautiful children. And you were married for ten years. Yes. Absolutely. Now, I guess because of what you've been through, you said, okay, that had kind of shaped some of your perception as far yeah, as uh, yeah. maybe that the other people are better or in a sense, not better, but. But it's not, that's what I think. Yeah. It's not like. When that. did that realization kick in for you? It's like, okay, this might <laughs> not be quite what I was thinking. My husband was quiet. He was very quiet. And I like a, a speaker, somebody would tell me, I ask you, how was your day? And you tell me, oh, baby, today work was great. This customer and this and that. You just tell me a story. Just tell me anything. I like, I find I'm, I'm intrigued by everything. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, excited about everything. I want to be excited about everything and nothing. Right. So I'm excited woman and I want to hear stuff from my husband or my partner and when people are so quiet it's kind of difficult but now wait, but, 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 but I, I hear what you're saying but he had to do something right four children well. 10 years <laughs> i mean he could be quiet but he had to be I, the sex know. was good okay yeah, all right all right well all right yeah but after <laughs> so so who decided to leave who i decided. you decided to leave him yes because i wanted to come home and he was uh wasting like he he say Africa is dangerous. He just think Africa is dangerous. It doesn't matter what I say. He just think Africa is dangerous, and we always have to fight about or argue about Africa. And but why I, did he marry you, an African woman, if that's the case? Why? why what? He he didn't what? like fufu. He didn't like to eat anything. But what from did he me. want with you? He liked me. He okay. liked me, but he doesn't like my culture with it. Some, so, some white men are like So what, did he like the sex, but not the culture? Did he like you? I mean, that, that, those are the things that, <laughs> because sometimes they, 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 they like us as people. I mean, and they like what, he they like our the physical, they like our physical attributes. Yeah. But when it comes to our culture and our essence of who we are, yeah. they don't want any parts of it. You know, that's what I've seen he liked the for taste, some. No. Let's say he liked the taste of me. I was like cocaine to him. Okay. I was like. <laughs> you should see the film crew. <laughs> All the eyes. <laughs> he liked Every it. And, and, and the man married me so fast. I thought, wow. I, he married me before I could even think about it. So I met him one year later. He wanted to marry me. And his whole family was against it. That is also the racism part that goes on in OK, Africa. let's talk about that. Then you, you realize that you think you are all that until somebody say you are not. Okay. The mother told him, if you marry this girl, it's a step backwards, and uh, I will never accept, him, uh, accept her, and uh, I will never give her my blessing, and stuff like that. So you're dealing with this on every level. Yeah. I mean, because as, as I'm looking they never at, accepted as me. an African woman, you've now dealing with this from your biological family. Now you go to Holland, you're dealing and with I'm this being rejected again. Again, yeah. How I've does this affect been... you? Because that's that's what I, I, I'm I'm getting at. I mean, I'm, uh, in one sense, how has this affected you as a woman, as a a mother, yeah. as someone? Because there are a lot of people who are dealing with this, and this is one of the reasons why I think this conversation is, is so important. Yeah. Because there are a lot of African women dealing with this. There are a lot of Brazilian women dealing with this. There are a lot of women yeah, in America so much rejection, uh, yeah. that, that are dealing with these not just rejection but abuses. Yeah, and uh, and dismissals and but with that, still having to raise the family, still having to provide because your story is so compelling. You go to this foreign country, yeah, and now all of your paperwork is taken from you. Yeah, I, I want I want you to answer the question about how this has affected you as an adult woman. 
Yeah. And then I'll come back to how did you establish your life? So how, how did this affect you as an adult woman? All of these rejections, your husband's mother rejecting you, now you deal um, with racism, which you probably didn't deal with in Africa. It's funny how incredibly uh, resilient I have so much of it, like a lot of, um, you know, I have a lot of good stuff in me, like positivity mm -hmm. and all this. But being rejected over and over again, that's something to do. It makes you feel like a small person, you know. But I have learned to not validate, uh, to validate myself and not have anybody validate me. Okay. Uh, every self-esteem I have, I build it myself. Okay. Every confidence I have, I build it myself. And now I say it confidently, like, I'm a mother of four. But I want the hottest guy in, in town because I deserve him. Okay. I'm I'm a mother of four, but I want a thirty year old man because I deserve him. I am a mother of four and <laughs> I'm not going for anything less than I deserve because I learned that. I learned that even if I have children, I still deserve the best. And I have the right to love too. So I have learned a lot of things myself by reading books, mm -hmm. reading therapeutic books and stuff like that. But these things affect me a lot and it took a long time before I could be able to get here. Because when you are rejected a lot of times, it becomes a thing that you're afraid of. Every time I meet people now, I'm still afraid that they're gonna reject me. You know? So I reject them before I was gonna they ask reject you, I was gonna me. Ask you I reject how them that before they you reject answered the question me, yeah. before I even asked yeah, the question. I, reject, I always push men away. I always push so people how do you away. Think that I don't like people to hurt me. So I hurt them before they hurt me. Okay, so do you think that's an area where therapy could be beneficial? It's not good, but that's how I dealt with my uh, trauma. So do you, you think know? that there's still... Of course still I want to be with somebody and trust them and they trust me, but I have trust issues. I can't trust men. I can't trust people, especially men. As soon as I have a man and my feelings are kicking in, mm -hmm. I start to find a reason to leave you. So then... Is that an area where you think therapy could be beneficial for you? Perhaps, yeah. Because I would imagine that we, you know, one thing I've learned, especially people who are of African descent, who are, have descended from trauma or some sort of abuse, yeah. that we learn how to cope with things, mm -hmm. but not necessarily reconcile those things. So we'll, we'll find a way to, you know, we'll have positive self-talk or we'll find drugs or alcohol or yeah, sex or food or I didn't do none of anything. that. I didn't have a, a addiction. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't do drugs. I don't do none of that. I make pictures. But I, I realize, I see a pattern in me that a lot of guys like me. Look at me. Every guy wants to be with me. But I just reject men. I don't know. So I what, don't know so why that, I do it. I so just where does reject that end up, though? Where does that end up for you? You know, if it's something you desire, you desire to be with uh, a in a healthy relationship. I want to have a healthy relationship, a good guy, somebody who actually understands me and I understand him, and somebody who understands my mindset. But I find it very difficult to find that kind of person here because um, I don't know, their thinking is very uh, what I rebel for, like a woman belongs in a kitchen. Not every guy, but most of them, they think that a woman has to do everything. Well, it depends. I think and it depends I on the culture. And I want to a man to to do something for me too. You know, say, oh, about what bread? You are tired. Sit down, and I will cook for you, or uh, pamper me as much as I pamper him. You know, they're, they're, those guys are out there. It, it's but but I I'm think I'm looking for them. <laughs> but I but I think that what what I'm hearing um, is in your story, you've learned how to cope. You are you are, you are, you have survived. I've survived, and yeah. you're still surviving. You know, because yeah. now, because the, the attention, the attention shifted from you to your children, yeah. and so oftentimes when when that happens, you know, now your children are 17 to 11. Mm -hmm. So for the past 17, 18 years, they have been your focus. Yeah. While you have coped 
you know, you went through a divorce, you went through the marriage, you yeah. went through all those different things. Yeah. And so now here you are coming to a phase in your life where they're going to be phasing out. They're going to yeah, be growing they're gonna up. Yeah, they're going to go out, yeah. So the thing. And now, now I'm looking, I'm back to myself. Because because I'm hearing right the story. Me, yeah. I mean, the story is, is you, you walked us through childhood mm -hmm. into motherhood. Yeah. Uh, into, well, into becoming a wife and into motherhood. Yeah. My, my question is, how does Mavis move forward healthy? Because I, I, because I, just in us having a conversation, I can see residue. You know, I can see like little parts of the things that are resonating that still yeah. affect you. It forms you. All these things forms you like a clay. You know, everything that happens to you in life forms you like a clay. So. I have become now so conscious of myself, so conscious and aware of everything around me that um, the alert goes all on when I see something like danger. Like the when I see somebody who lied to me, I really hate people who lie to me. I can't stand lies. So if you lie to me one time, mm -hmm. it's finished. So let me ask you this. You can see the alert go off with others. Can you see the alert? within yourself oh yes what does that look like <laughs> i just told you well no no no. that's that's from an outside yeah stimulus meaning someone else does something it triggers something yeah but how you know how we all have internal things that we're dealing with we have our yeah. own insecurities oh, our of own course. Of course. our own stuff our own stuff yeah so how does mavis recognize her own stuff <laughs> that with not not anybody else because we all have stuff. it. We got our own. Yeah, er, yeah. Everybody has it. How do you recognize your own stuff? I feel like um, I can take in a lot. Like I can handle a lot until a person lies to me. Then I trigger. Okay. I can go like off the roof if somebody lied to me. So you can recognize I'd rather that. Okay. have you say to me, I slept with that girl and I fucked her and I mm -hmm. did this. And I'm fine with it. But if you tell me you didn't and I find out you did, it makes me furious. But and you I know, a know lot why. of people are resonating with what you're saying right now. Because yeah, it's not the first time I've heard that. I want people to just be honest about stuff. Say it how it is, and then we put it on the table. We talk about it. But, and you say, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. And then it's done. Case die. But what does it really die, though? It dies. If someone lies to I you. I would never leave a man for sleeping with somebody else. But you said a little while ago you have trust issues. Well, what is the, what is that? How does that break down? If you sleep with somebody else, it can happen. If we have a relationship, it, it, a lot of people cannot hold it together. Like, oh, I, you know, I talked last time about libido thing. Yes. I have a very high one. Okay. You know, a sky high. I'm waiting wait for the fellas in the. <laughs> I'm waiting for all the eyes to pop up over <laughs> the cameras. <on. laughs> I wish they I had on camera very over this sexual, side. Sexual, a high <laughs> sexual drive. Okay, so if my husband doesn't have the same level of okay. high, uh, sexual drive then there's a problem Got it. because then i'll always be in the mood and he will not be in the mood and the other way around other way around yeah so oh. yeah when i meet people nowadays i ask them what is your sex drive like you know a lot of so that's your interview question when you use yes it. <laughs> that's one of the date questions like how is your sex drive you okay. know how is your that's why you like level? a 30 year old man <laughs> <laughs> Because if mine is high, I mean, an old man will not work for me. You know? <laughs> I don't want to be responsible for somebody's death, you know? So, um, you know, men can have heart attacks, I heard. I heard. So, yeah, so <laughs> I don't want to kill anybody. But what I'm saying is focus, focus. That's what real, that's real. I'm <laughs> But that's I real. Mean, that's I, real. That's some not a guarantee that a younger man can do the job or get the job done. But so, so at least there's hope. Okay, so so with all of this. Okay, <laughs> so when there's the the the, 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 the couple or yeah. your partner doesn't have the same level of drive as you, then then they want more and you want less, and that's when the cheating comes. Okay, in. Okay, so that's when the cheating. We back know, around I to the think, cheating, everybody. You know, yeah, and I think it's not an excuse to cheat. But, but is it cheating? Let's walk down that road a little bit. I think we should all be open-minded. I mean, I, w I don't like to do three so many stuff, but if you happen to slip off once in a while and you wear a condom, I could let it slide. I don't mind. Just protect yourself. I will buy you a condom to protect yourself. Okay. And then it's cool. But, but a lot of people don't see it like that. I see it like all that. All right. You cannot, you cannot have one 
penis all by yourself. It's just not done. Okay. Well, that's, a whole, that's, a, that's a whole different not conversation. Here. I yeah. think that the men here are very uh, panagamy. Okay. Panagamy means they want multiple women. And the sooner we, the women, understand that, But is, that here? But, but, but is that here? Is that here? Or is that just across the board? Most black men have this panagamy thing. Is it black men or white men, too? Because I know a bunch of white no, men. No, white men are doing it. I, oh, I, but, 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 no, I don't no, know. No, they were, they were around not back openly. In the day. They were not openly about it. Sure they were. They were trying to stick with one woman the whole time. No, and now they can't. No, when they were down, when they were down here during, during colonization time and slavery time. They still did it. That's how... That's so how I got all this European thing. floating okay. in my blood right now. So it's a, I think it's a man thing. I think yeah. it's I think it's a man. It's a man thing. Because if you get men talking among themselves, yeah, and this they is what always I try to say. want different women. Well, which is well no, thing. no, no, no. It's it's the fact that when you, if you get men talking among themselves and they're being honest among themselves, they will. While some of them are very monogamous. Yeah. But if you really talk to them, their eye sees everything. You know, their eye will t they will say, "Oh yeah, I saw so and so, and she looked pretty good." Oh yeah, well, and, and, they, and they maybe they haven't done anything, but their eye recognizes it. A man can have a fantasy, you know. Women too. Women have them, yeah. And when I was married, I would come home and tell my husband, "I saw this hot guy in a bus. Oh my god." And what did he say? I he doesn't like that, but I want a man that I can talk to like that. I if I, w I was your partner, mm -hmm. and I saw a hot girl with a, a nice ass, I would say, "Jay, look at that ass! Wow!" I want a guy I can talk like that with. We flirt together, you well, know, then, not like obsessively jealous man. It doesn't work. But for that me. but that requires two healthy people, if you yeah. will. If, I mean, t according to what you're uh, what you're looking for, it would require someone on that same. Level of thinking, right? Think. And so, so that's where it gets. You have to play a little bit and understand that if there's a hot woman, you have to recognize it. And even if you don't see it, I'll make you see it. Like that girl has a fine ass, don't you think? Maybe. And I'll tell my husband that, and I would like to <laughs> to say it and freely say it like that. You know, well, I'm not a lesbian, but I want to admire another woman. And. For this, you. Is, this thing has gone all the way down a whole <laughs> path here, I tell you. Just and <laughs> if a guy is hot, I want to be able to say it like that guy is hot. Well, I, I, this is what I will say. Without any fight. Well, I, and, and it requires a level of shared, philo shared philosophy. Yeah, because some people it. don't share that same philosophy. Some people yeah. are on a different. Some people yeah, are like, hey, don't. They, they, see they, yeah. they see it as disrespect. But they see it as disrespect. They see it as if you're walking down the street and a man looks at another woman's physique. Now he's being disrespectful if he's with this lady. I believe that's also you cultural too. You can't control too. people's eyes. Well, it's called, I also believe it's cultural. I think yeah. culture plays a big part yeah. in this. But that's why I tell you, I'm not anything like a Ghanaian. My culture in my mind is all against the culture here. I, I think different. I was always like that, not because I was in Europe, that's why I'm like that. I think very different. And my thinking, according to my, my family, I'm not normal. I'm the different one, okay. you know? And I accept that, I embrace it. I think being different is good. Different is good, it's not bad, well. you know? So in the end, there was a white man who helped me. He brought me home and he helped me. He, he brought me to school, he teach me how to swim, how to bike, everything. Mm -hmm. And then he eventually convinced me for a whole year to go to the police. And he held my hand like this and brought me to the police. And then the police helped me. As he said, they gave me all the papers I have So the now. police in Holland ended up helping you? Yes, that's very they are good people. And, and that's very interesting. They listened to my story. I asked them to give me a map and I showed them bit by bit how I came there. They always want to uh, know So you how told you them, came. look, I came here illegally. I yeah, came here I under came. the this table. This is how I came through this. this, this and this. I paid this money, and this is what it I is. I did not pay money. Right, right, I you didn't. I was brought. And so they were waiting for that money. They were basically want to put you in the sex, yes. sex trade. Yes. And you, you escaped it. Yes. So after all of that, mm -hmm. you went to the police. They helped you out. Mm -hmm. they, they established your life. You weren't married at this point. No. Where did your life go from there once they got you... How did you get housing? How did you build your life um, from nothing? I mean, I stayed with uh, Yitza, the first white guy who found me for about three and a half years. And I have studied, I have done my integration uh, studies. So they call it in Berkeley. And I've done all the schooling. So somehow he liked a lot of black women. So me and him didn't work out. 
because I was a bit jealous. <laughs> so we broke up and then I went to stay in my own place. It was like a student town. Okay. okay. And then a friend of mine from uh, New Zealand brought me out by force. She said, come, we are going out. And then that's when I met my husband. We went to a sport where um, a lot of rugby players came. Okay. And then that's how I met my husband. He saw me and I was like the most beautiful thing that ever happened to him. He just stared at me the whole night. Really? And I didn't even notice him until my friend told me, this guy has been looking at you all night. I said, oh, let's go get him then. And then I just went to get him to grab him to dance with me. And that's how it started. And the rest is history. Yeah. <laughs> Four beautiful children later yes. and, and an amazing story. He was so crazy about me. We got married a year later. And that's how everything happened. But I want to say, like, the, as soon as I got a white man and everything was going on, then my mom started calling. I had to send money home. This money sending home thing is a big problem in Ghana. Every time there's uh, somebody abroad, they demand and push and force you to send money home, which is very stressful for people abroad. And I think that's should change. I don't know if well, I can change that, but you, I think you, you that change should change. About, you can change it by not sending the money. <laughs> I, I'm, just, I'm just saying. Because they resent you, they, 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 they get angry resents. at you, uh -huh. they, they, they say horrible things. It's a form of abuse but listen, also. But, but I think it's a form of it. abuse. But she already did it, according you know? to what and you're telling And then they us. force you to build a house. But listen to what I'm saying. They don't care whether you're cleaning or something. <laughs> listen to what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> listen to what I'm saying. Yeah. She already did this, according to what you said. Yeah. So is. why send money to some, why send money to an abuser? I mean, I, I try, they, they think it's a form of help. You have to help your family if you're in, in abroad and you have a little bit of money, you have to help Or your they family. perceive that you have money. They perceive you but have money. But why send money to an abuser? That's the question. That's the question. But I was ge generous enough to send it every month. And I couldn't even miss that money, but I send it every month, 100 Oh, but what euros. was in what was in you to send money to this person you said abused you so horribly? They see it as she's your mother, so why don't so you no help matter, your mother? So no matter no what matter type of what abuse she carry you for nine months, why would you not help your mother? And just but, and just give you hell when you come out. Yeah. And but you still support. I supported. But yes. you understand the that's a question that somebody yeah, I know. might have. It's very hard to even comprehend, like. I don't understand even up to today a lot of things. The, the housing thing. They think that everybody who goes to Abrochiri, which is Europe, must build a house. I still come in, the, in Ghana now and I don't have a place to sleep because everybody who has a house don't want to give me a place to sleep because they think that you should by force build your own because you've been in a, abroad for 23 years. They calculate how many years you've been there and how much money you should have and why you should build a house. But is, is that? But a, I was a mother. But is that a form of? Um, is that a form? That mentality. Is that a form of uh, European supremacy? Is that a form Perhaps. of? You know, because they're thinking, well, you've been to Europe, you've been yeah, to this place. The moment you have uh, been to Europe, you've married to a white white person. Oh, that's it. You should be you, good. You should be very rich. It's just point. the the zero mind mindset that is here that I think that it's about time that it change, because now there's social media, and now Europe is outside. Everybody can see what Europe is. Our living rooms are outside. They can see how filthy it really yeah. is. Yeah. So how, it's not, not all the whole that. Europe, you know. It's not all that. So people should drop all that mindset but it's been entrenched and see for that years. it's not easy there. It's just, it's hard work, sweat and blood. But you know what? That someone here in Ghana, uh, he worked at a night establishment, and he was like, oh, America, man. You know, the America, it is America. And I was like, I said, yeah, America's nice. Don't get me wrong. It's nice. It's nice, I said, but, but it's not special. But, I said, but that's what I said. I said, but you see, I'm here. Yeah. And he was like, yes, but you can go back. And so we talk about mindset, mindset. <laughs> and I was like, wow, he doesn't even see what he has in front of him. No, he, he doesn't does, see all of us coming here. A lot here. of Ghanaians don't value Ghana because they don't know what it is. But it where is, does that come from? It is, um, 
Yeah, brainwash. But that's what I'm saying. Yeah, so where it comes from somewhere. Yeah, someone says that what you have is no good. It's not good. You what are we not have is better. Yeah. And come to us, come and to we're going to cause you to now dislike what you have. Absolutely, yeah. And, and not even see but the value. But in the end, here. they like what we have. That's, what, that's the point. Yes, that's, that's, that's the point. And that's what I was trying to get him to see, yeah. that no matter what I said. You can't change people's it's, mind here. It was like, well, no, I don't see it's it. Just, it's just their way of seeing things. And like I told you, I went to my sisters. I took a plane to go see my sisters. And they see only the plane tickets. They don't see that the idea of, of, of the idea behind it that I came to say hello and to have lunch with them or spend time with them. They don't see that. They see, oh, how much did the plane ticket cost from Accra to Kumasi? She could have done something else with that money. That's what they are thinking. But I'm thinking, I don't want to drive because it takes so long like four hours to get to Kumasi. Yeah, and with the bus, it's forever. Yeah. Flight is one hour. Not so it I, saves yeah. me time. Then I have more time with you. But they don't see it like that. So they think I'm just throwing money away or I don't know. They have such a very different way of thinking that I, I feel like I don't belong here anymore. When I'm in Holland, I don't feel like I belong in Holland. When I'm here, I feel so lost. I don't understand anything here. I feel like they call me Obibi New Brony. That means a white woman, white black I woman. Don't I don't know. So I'll be with him, Brony. I've become. I don't understand the man. No, they no. don't. They what's the What's don't. the term for black people in Holland? They don't like. Um, they They don't call people names. I think Holland Dutch people are very accepting for black people than the other people in You mean Dutch people in Holland? Yeah, in Holland. They are very... Um, I mean, Dutch, they, they, if you look at the history of the Dutch, that's a rough breed. I know, breed. but that's maybe a rough, it's a guilty breed. thing or something. That's I don't know, rough. but they are more accepting, I think, than the Germans. Or the, the Germans, they know. make you see they don't like you, so you know. Okay. But I think there is always racism everywhere. You know, sometimes when you go to a store, they think we are always thieves because we are black. But the white people are stealing the stuff. And then they will follow oh, you around. Oh, they do that in Holland? Yeah, the white uh, folks uh, steal the stuff and they will they be following you around, around with the uh, walkie-talkie. Yeah, they do that. Like uh, you are a thief, yes. Yeah, they do it in America like that. Yeah, too. they walk around with you all the time. And when you are in the, in the bra session, they are there. Everywhere session you are, they are there. And it makes you uncomfortable. I see it, but I pretend I don't see it. I just if, ignore it. If I see somebody it. follow me around, I come right at them. I want to thank Mavis for joining us today and sharing her story. And there are so many layers to this that we could take away from it. I believe it's important for us to have open and honest conversations so that we can get rid of some of this dysfunction within our families, within our collective cultural communities. Uh, and it's, it's important because most of us don't realize someone's story. And as she so candidly shared today, uh, there, there are so many aspects to it that affect us as adults, which then trickle down to our children, which could uh, lead to an impact on our relationships and on so many different levels. So one thing I would encourage you to do is that if this is something that resonates, that her story resonates with you, and if it's something that you've been dealing with within yourself, I encourage you to go seek some form of therapy to be able to help you reconcile these uh, issues. And there's nothing wrong with you. You're not crazy. You're not... Um, there's nothing wrong with you, that's the bottom line. And so go get the help that you need from someone who's reputable, from a professional, and really focus more on you healing so that you can show up in the world better for yourself and for others. So until next time, you know what to do. Make sure that you like, subscribe, and share Maximum Impact with Jay Cameron. This is how we bridge the gap between Africa and the African diaspora. Until next time, take care, be safe.